Well, where I'm from, which is a small town in Switzerland, just outside of Geneva, I have the privilege of introducing my neighbor. <laughs> um, and this is Tom Bloomer, and he shares precious gardening tips with all of us. Mm. But of course, in terms of who he is internationally, we have known for many years that he led um, the University of the Nations as provost um, and just retired a few years ago. So he now holds the title of the first provost emeritus. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a treasured, a treasured person in terms of what he brings to us as a mission, um, a known prophet who I know to be a very humble man. Um, and I just highly recommend him to you. Um, someone that I see walk out his faith every day practically. Um, and it's such a joy to be able to walk part of that journey with him. So. Here's my friend, Tom the Gardener. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, Tom. Yeah. I'll just add just a few, more, a few more sentences about Tom because he's, um, yes, he is emeritus and that part I really don't like about his situation because you're greatly missed, Tom. You really are. Um, he's also an insightful historian and an organic gardener as well as prophet. Um, I just I was thinking about you last night, Tom, and I thought you are um, you you've you've seen what grew in the past, and you observe what grows and where it grows in the present, and I think that also gives you a unique position along with your uh, unique spiritual gifts to imagine and discern what prophetic prophetically will be uh, you know grow in the future. Tom is also Doctor Tom. He's author Tom. He's educator Tom. He's storyteller Tom. And he's definitely also the prophet, Tom. And the many times you've spoken to the mission, people listen. It's, um, and I think with this word, it also just went viral. Uh, it, it is a real boat rocker. <laughs> uh, and I think you will send waves for a long time and it was needed. So thank you, Tom, for, for being the master pruner, for giving us this word. Before we dive in, can I, can I just pray for us um, this time? So Holy Spirit, we pray that you would uh, help Tom clearly communicate what is on his heart in a way that we, the receivers, can receive. Lord, would you open our spiritual and eyes and spiritual ears to understand and discern the time we live in and your word to us and, and help us to serve and, and lead accordingly. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Good to be with you, friends. <clears throat> Let me share a few thoughts as I have um, been asked to share with other groups, and I've had younger leaders writing to me with their questions and thoughts. So that's kept me thinking about this word. It's a path that I've been on for a couple years now, actually. That's when the Lord started pruning me. He told me no more international trips for ministry, especially intercontinental. After March 2018, when I returned from Kona, where I officially stepped down as provost and became provost emeritus. So uh, my travel schedule was cut back to almost nothing. My teaching schedule was cut way back, although I continued to teach in the Swiss schools and in by Skype. So I was going through this um, without that word pruning. And I know some people have, have reacted that it's, it, it's a very strong word. Well, friends, pruning is a very violent exercise. Uh, I'm sure many of you know secateurs. Little tool, but it can easily take off a finger, very easily. And then there are bigger secateurs such as this bad boy. This is an anvil secateur, which means that the blade, which is can be very sharp, comes, comes down on a steel uh, anvil here. And that means you can cut off a, a pretty big branch or three fingers, if you like. I don't recommend that, but 
this is a powerful tool. But it's interesting that whoever did the visuals for Lynn's blog put on a, an ax and a chopping block. Well, that's not a pruning tool. <laughs> you would never prune with an ax like that because you would not get a clean cut. I have two uh, pruning saws. These are actually given to me by two different donors two years apart. And th this is an incredible, incredibly sharp saw. And the teeth are designed to cut through green wood and leave a, a flat cut, which will heal much faster, which is why you don't bang at a, a branch, a green branch, with a, with the same kind of hatchet you'd use to chop your firewood. Um, these are these are deadly violent tools, very necessary for the gardener, especially the gardener who's interested in fruit. Um, Cynthia couldn't stand it when I pruned, so I would have to wait until she goes shopping, then I'd go out and do the pruning, and hope that she didn't notice very quickly. But it is a violent exercise, and when you first start out as a as an amateur gardener, you're sure you're going to kill the plant. You just don't want to do it, which is why you kind of have to be discipled into it. But as John 15 tells us so accurately in terms of the botanical world, sorry, um, everything's got to be pruned. I have four grapevines, and I love the grapes in September, October. But that means those four grapevines have to be severely pruned over a year. I'm sorry about this. My internet went out yesterday, and I was trying to get hold of these people all day long, and it's only now that they're calling back. <laughs> so help. Um, so I still cannot prune those grapevines. I'm, uh, I have a friend who's happy to come in and do it for me. He's a pro and he can do it in 10 minutes. And, you know, I'd be standing there agonizing over each branch. It would take me many hours, but pruning is, is not an option if you want fruit. If you want just growth and a lot of beautiful green leaves, yeah, fine. You can just let them, let that stuff grow. <clears throat> My grapevines are against a south-facing wall here. <clears throat> Excuse me, where it faces toward Geneva. And if I didn't uh, constantly cut them back during growing season, they would grow right across that um, two-meter entrance to my garden, completely block it, and I would have very little fruit. The reason the Lord wants to prune us is so that we would bear fruit. But we, in our human nature, resist the pruning. It is violent. It is. But here's a question I would, I would have. People say, well, how do you think people are taking your word? I say, well, of course, I don't know. There's always a huge variation in, in the application of these kind of words. And I'm not the, I'm not the application policeman. That's the responsibility of each ministry leader we will be held responsible for the fruit that we that we show or that we could have shown. But I just have the impression that Frank kind of alluded to this. A Swiss pastor said it this way, because I'm I'm part of a a group that meets regularly for prayer of Swiss pastors and spiritual leaders. And we've been meeting regularly for 40 years. So these are very close, dear relationships. And I submitted this word to, to them, and I said, might this be a word for the rest of the church and not just YWAM? And, and they said yes. And one pastor responded, the prayer I hear about in our churches is too much pious businesses, or the religious busyness, with the hope to get back as soon as possible to the old ways of doing things. I pray that that is not what's happening in YWAM. 
because as many have said, it reminded us that the Chinese word for, or Chinese pictogram for crisis also includes opportunity. And I believe we have a God-given, historic, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to remake YWAM. And if we just are trying to get back as soon as possible to what we used to do with as little pain as possible, we have not understood God's ways. Um, I think we really need to look very carefully before we try to before we try to go back to normal. And I'm not talking about what we heard of from from Russia. That's fantastic. If this if this thing is opening up new doors of ministry for you, go for it. Run for it. Go all out, please. Because there again, that is a a once in a in a every few years opportunity. And after people, after things, if they do get back to normal, people will not be as open as they were before. We know this. We know this from the history of, of Russia in the 90s as well, as Al Akimov often reminds us. But here's the question I have. One is about the Sabbath, too. The other, first one is about the pruning. And I, I think this enforced Sabbath is also a God-given opportunity. And Lauren said this, Al Akimov said it, that's where I noticed it first. And um, I'm just wondering how many of our bases are really having a Sabbath? Or have we just moved all our activities online? I think we have a, another God-given opportunity here, is that, and that is to give our staff some rest. Most of our staff runs ragged most of the year. And I'm closest to some of our school leaders. I was in touch with one school leader from Switzerland here, a Swiss base, who was just saying, I am much more tired now than before because they moved everything to Zoom. And I, I can hardly stand it anymore. Now, this person is a classic introvert, and online meetings are harder for introverts. But I'm just, I'm just saying maybe, maybe we should look at the rhythm of our bases in this time, which for many of us is, is not increased opportunity necessarily, but it's forced rest. Well, let's take it. Let's take it. And in a Sabbath time, sabbatical in the academic world is a time for research and writing. They send you away for six months, usually, on a paid thing. You can go anywhere in the world and do anything you want, but you got to come back with, with research. Cynthia's father did this, and he, he came to Europe. They lived in, in Holland, in Netherlands for three months, and in, in Lausanne for three months when, when the kids were small. And so they, they already knew and loved Lausanne before Cynthia and I ever got here. So this is another thing our staff could be doing. They could be set free to do research, to take courses. How many of your staff have had three months of Bible? I think every single missionary, every single minister of the gospel needs to have three months of the Bible. Now they can get that. They can do it on our online program. There are lots of ways they can get that. But let's, let's watch over this Sabbath. <clears throat> but ab about the fruit. One young base leader from North America wrote me and he said, well, Tom, how do I know what, what needs to be pruned? And I said, listen, you're the fruit inspector. Look at the fruit of your ministries. And I think, you know, some of what we do is, is hard to quantify, um, such as prayer. Every one of our centers is a, is a prayer center. And I think we we probably underestimate what the Lord does through those prayers. But if we're praying week in and week out, we should see some changes in what we're praying. Um, in the situations we're praying for, and they should be noticeable and confirmed by outside sources. And I'd encourage you in your intercession and your basis to, to target 
your prayer and make them so specific that you'll know whether they're answered or not. I was raised in the Protestant church in America, and we were always very careful to pray prayers that were so vague, nobody knew if they were answered or not. Well, that's not helpful. But here's the thing. What, what is the fruit of your different ministries? How many people are being impacted? And is that a lasting impact? <clears throat> and of course, in evangelism, we know how to count this. We count so many people heard the gospel. Of those people, so many made decisions. Of the ones who made decisions, so many were following up with. Those are the kinds of numbers we need to know. In our training ministries, how many people are we impacting? Um, and are we still in touch with them? Are we following up with the fruit? Mercy ministries, same thing. I, I'm sure there's pruning going on, but I haven't heard of any. And I get a lot of YWAM newsletters. I haven't heard of any ministries being shut down. Um, my feeling, and I, I could be wrong, you know, I submit this to you, that I, I feel like we have the opportunity here if we don't let it zip by us because in Switzerland too, they're loosening up. They're starting to loosen up starting the 27th. Not for old people like me, but for people younger than 65, things are gonna be much looser starting 27 April already. Then there was a phase two on the 11th of May, two weeks later. Um, but I think as the U of N is moving into what we're calling U of N 3.0, Tova can tell you about that more than I know. But I think we have the opportunity to move into YOM 3.0. And if I may say so, we, we lived the first nine years of our existence as a mission without a single base. We had an office in, in Burbank in California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles that people made jokes about for so many years. And then for ever since 69, we've for 50 years now, we've had bases, and that's been, been our principal structure in YWAM. I had another young leader write to me from South America, and he said, yeah, I'm, we have this team in the city, but I always feel like I'm, I'm not a success in YWAM unless I start a base, unless I get a building. Well, why? You know, you don't have to do that. And I would love to see us move into an era after 50 years of YWAM 3.0, where we don't think that if, if you're gonna be successful, your team has to grow into a base and you have to take on a building. Now I was base leader at Lausanne for years and, and I loved doing it. Cynthia and I were a team, she loved doing it. We were um, relatively new Christians, young leaders, and we had a bunch of young people around us that are still very close friends. The French ministries was taking off. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I learned, um, I was discipled in that structure of the base. Don Stevens was a base leader. And we met weekly with him or, or more often for three years. And he and Dion really discipled us. And we disciple the ones, the younger ones who came alongside us. And I think the Lord gave us bases so that we would be discipled. We would have to learn the, the decision, how to, how to take care of a building. You know, one thing we have to learn in the Northern hemisphere is you got to leave some heat on in the winter, even if no one's in that apartment or the, the, the pipes will bust. They'll freeze and they'll break. How many bases have I heard about where they have to, they wake up in the spring and find their pipes broke. <laughs> they have to replace the pipes in one or another of the apartments or houses. So it's these kind of things that we had to learn the hard way. We had to learn about reality of taking care of, of vehicles, of, of checking the oil, of, of paying taxes, of keeping our kitchens up to standard. And this was preparation to disciple nations. If we can't take care of a, of, a, of a couple buildings on a base, how can we talk about discipling nations? We have no authority, whatever. 
So bases were good, and I think that bases will continue to be a necessary part of YWAM. But as I mentioned in that thing I wrote that Lynn posted, um, I, I see tiny little bases and teams pouring their hearts and their lives out and not bearing much fruit. And I would be overjoyed if we would close 500 bases. I, th I think it's possible that we may be forced to economically anyway, <clears throat> because I don't know of any YWAM bases who have financial reserves. And I think that's a question that you as, as leaders of, of areas need to be asking the base leaders. How long can you go if your shutdown continues? We want to know how long do you can you pay your bills? Because it'd be better to, to try to sell those bases now than to wait till the banks take them away from us. So any base that, that has a bank mortgage, of course, is especially vulnerable. For, for, for years, our, our bigger bases, our 40 biggest bases, were training most of our, a huge amount of our students. I remember when it was 40%, then it went up to 50% of our students worldwide. Then it went up to 60% and it's increasing. Those big bases are the ones bearing the fruit in training. And it's partly because of the word of mouth. People, people are telling each other, hey, if you want an exciting DTS, go to Kona, go to Lausanne, you know. The bigger bases are the ones that are, are bearing the most fruit in, in student training and with outreaches. Now, we, should, we shouldn't get rid of our small bases necessarily either. We have legacy bases uh, like Bertigny, which are running with pretty low numbers right now, but there's no way we're going to sell this property because it came with an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance. It, claimed, it came with piles of unanswered prayers. And we got a lot of these bases around the world that we are going to keep no matter what. But let's not try to hang on to, to branches that are not bearing much fruit, to put it in, in those terms. I, I think what we could do is, is encourage people to move out of situations where they're under such huge pressure, like this one young man who was thinking he was not a success in YWAM unless he had a building and a base, and we need to move them into different situations. We can sell off some of these bases and use the, that, those funds to give scholarships to YWAMers to get the education they need to, be, to, to go into the spheres. We don't have a plan for the spheres in YWAM. We talk about them a lot, we teach about them, but we don't have a strategic plan. And I know as a base leader, the incredible amount of work it takes to keep a base running. I mean, the amount of energy, the hours, the, the chunks of time it takes in people's life to run a base are huge. And as, and as I said, those are necessary, especially if the base has a very intentional discipling strategy. You can see a lot of fruit when you are, when you are running a base and you have base staff that are, um, that are being discipled through their serving. But I, one of the problems I have is that most of this work falls on singles and couples without children. And I'm thinking about making a proposal to the Founders Circle that we, that we put a, a phrase in there about valuing singles in YWAM. There's nothing about singles. We say we value families. We say we value single parent families. Great. Fine. But there's nothing about valuing singles. And I think that singles are sometimes um, really the neglected, invisible people on bases. So much is oriented toward families. So I am, I am publicizing what the guys in Norway are doing. Uh, Joachim contacted me a number of years ago when they were trying to work out how to do a DTS in Oslo with their new model. Um, 
which was very difficult. And I was very happy to hear that they were going to probably stop that. Because the DTS model we have, we came up with in the context of a base in a building. And when we try to take it out of a base in a building, it is very hard to make it work. Now you can, you can do that. We, we worked with the Koreans for years so that their university DTS could be a recognized DTS. But it took thousands and thousands of hours. We worked with Joachim so his program could be a recognized DTS, but it took hundreds and hundreds of hours. Here's my idea, forget bases, forget DTS if you're not gonna have a base. Don't try to do a DTS. You can do seminars, which are much more accessible and much more useful and much more strategic in reaching the spheres if you reorient and do short one, two, three week seminars and um, invite people in, in for those. So um, I, I was in touch with Andreas recently and asked him to write me something because I was telling these young guys, hey, you don't have to have a building. You don't have to have a base. YWAM didn't have a base in the early years and YWAM is gonna continue on if we never have a, if we have to give up all our bases. Bases do not define who we are. We never even had a definition of a YWAM base. We, we tried for years to define the definition of a base. Okay, these are the, what you need to have a YWAM base. Could never come up with it because there was so much variation. Okay, let's just forget it. If people are called to have a base, if they have a lot of the, um, uh, if, if, if they have a lot of numbers and, and the size and the, the visionary uh, apostolic communication capacity for that, that's wonderful. Yeah. But what I'm, what I'm pushing us to consider is what they're doing in Oslo and Trondheim and some, a third place in, in Norway. And that is no base. They're located, as I understand it, near the university. So a lot of the university students who have been with YWAM or done YWAM or they were in King's Kids, they are attracted to this community, but the community is out in different apartments and, and houses. And there's no YWAM leadership team having to take care of that base. And they don't have to organize the cleaning and the, the meals for hundreds of people and the cleanup and all that stuff. It's done house by house. And each little group from three to seven people usually, they organize it the way they want. They organize their prayer, they organize their worship. And then um, they have a celebration meeting where they all come together. I think uh, Alf was talking to us about it and it was five, 500 people. Uh, once a month or something. Anyway, Andreas Tova know much more about this than I do, so I, I won't try to describe it. And Andreas has this written piece that you can ask him if he can send you if you're interested. But I think that is the way to go for the future. I think we need YWAM 3.0 so that we can start to be effective in the spheres. And I think there are in every city of the world hundreds and thousands of people who did YWAM, who know YWAM, who would like to know YWAM, and they're just waiting for one thing, they're waiting to be called together. Now this needs to be an apostolic leader. You can't just do it because you wanna do it, you have to have the gift for it. <clears throat> Joachim is willing to welcome people to come see what they're doing in Oslo. That's, a, that's an alternative, but I'll tell you something that broke my heart, and I'm going to close with this for my part. Um, we read a book by a guy called, I think his name was John Davidson Hunter or something on worldview. And he said, the, the body of Christ is not changing the nations. And he's, a, he's an American, so he listed all these North American ministries like um, Focus on the Family and Liberty University and all these evangelical groups. And he said, they're not having an impact on the nation. They're not, all they're doing, they're spending a lot of money and a lot of effort. They're, they're nice people, but they're not changing the nation. And he said, it was a very interesting book. He said something that I'll never forget. He said, changing your worldview is like trying to change 
trying to push a broken down van, only you're inside the van. Now in the 70s, I pushed a lot of broken down YWAM vans over and over and over. That's what we did for entertainment. But to try to push a van from inside, no. You don't change worldviews by changing ideas. It's much more complex, it's much deeper. Anyway, so this guy comes out with an article just two years ago that David Hamilton found. And I never got the original article. Maybe we can try to unearth that. But he wrote this whole thing about, he said, how did the gay, lesbian, bi, queer people change every nation in the world? How did they go from being inacceptable, verboten, to being the way everybody should believe? How did that happen? He said, I'll tell you how it happened. I researched it. And what they did was they found the messages of Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham on the spheres. And they took that teaching on the spheres, which YWAM did not, Campus Crusade did not, and they applied those messages and they, they went to change every sphere in every nation and they did it in a very short time, less than 10 years. I, my heart broke when I heard that. The Lord gave us that message. He gave it to Lauren in the late 70s. I remember hearing it in 77 at a staff conference in England. And we all said, yeah, well, not all, but all of us, but most of us said, yeah, right on, spheres, yeah. And some individuals were pre got prepared to say things in spheres. We have our stories, but as a mission, we did not have a strategy. We had no way to mobilize the church into that. But this, this model of what they're doing in, in Oslo, and of course, it can be modified. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing in every city. Uh, it give, gives us a way to network people who are already there. They're studying in the spheres, getting their professional qualifications, or they're working in the spheres, and they're open to mentoring the younger ones, and all they want is fellowship. And we can facilitate um, communication and networking across spheres because things don't happen in just one sphere it's it's always linked even in the word it's always linked so that's my hope is that we see a ywam 3.0 by the grace of god thank you so much tom i think um by a lot of what you shared you actually answered quite a few of the questions that we had uh, we have a lot more questions and i think you just uh, opened up this uh, wasp nest whatever even bigger so i think uh, we, we need much more time to wrestle with this um some questions um are also related to of course it's a bunch of leaders here and we sit with a lot of questions in, in how do we go about the pruning then you know so we have the master pruner god uh, you have the, the individual, you have the base leader, you have the, you know, leadership on all those levels. And we have probably, or we have shifted how we do leadership in some ways. Um, um, so some, in some places we ask the question, who has, a, a, who has the authority to say no or to come in with the pruning equipment? By the way, I also brought all my pruning equipment, Tom, so... <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so have we weakened ourselves and have we weakened, you know, the structure we have created? Have we weakened the possibility or the authority to say no and to prune? Um, I just wonder if you have a few bits of input on the whole leadership aspect and pruning. Well, I have maybe a couple thoughts. I don't have the answers because I've been thinking about this for years. I think... As you know, I teach on transactional transformational leadership. And I just heard again two days ago from a European leader who's weeping because of feedback he's gotten from people in, in his nations who've been hurt by abusive leaders. So it's an ongoing problem. It's, in, it's everywhere. So I think, you know, I understood what Lauren wanted to do when he said no more national directors, no more 
directors except at base level. And I think that was the right decision because we couldn't go on the way we were. However, two problems. One is those leaders didn't just go away. A lot of them stayed in YWAM and they're still there. They haven't changed their leadership style. The other problem is that what that we tried to deal with the problem by saying, okay, no more directors, we just have conveners. But we did not solve the problem of accountability. And if you're serious about discipleship, you've got to be serious about accountability. And so what happens in um, in the church throughout history is we go we swing from one extreme to another. We go toward requiring too much accountability in every single little area of life. You got someone telling you what to do or anarchy. Anyone does whatever they will. So it's very hard to walk that line in the middle where there's real accountability, but freedom for initiative and freedom to do new things. And we have gotten it right in YOM more often than not, but our, some of our failures have been spectacular. So I would, uh, I would hope that um, Lynn says we'll do it relationally. Well, yeah, I listened to him say that. Um, but that means that you guys, leaders at your level, need to really invest relationally. And you need to gain the authority to be able to speak into people's lives. Now, I'm not proposing here, which some have feared, that uh, we're going to get some group together that's going to go around telling people what they need to shut down, what they need to stop doing. No, that is not our way in YWAM. And I would hope that this would be voluntary. But people aren't going to leave the security of what they know how to do without being shown and coached through and maybe even financed through an alternative. So that's where we need leadership who has gained their trust, who can able, be able to walk them through to YWAM 3.0. Yes, no, that's good. Uh, very good. Um, another question that several people asked, um, it is, we've been talking about pruning, especially like small teams, small bases. Um, um, yeah, small ministries. Do you think there's an aspect of pruning also with some of the bigger bases and bigger campuses? Because at times we see some of the bigger numbers, they go through DTSs on large bases, but they, they don't stay, stay on, nor go out and make any significant um, uh, impact, and they are not being encouraged to maybe to go to smaller places where there's something maybe fruitful going on that would fit who they are. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Our large bases need to be pruned too, and may, they may need more pruning actually because they've had more more growth. But the the other thing we need to be doing besides looking at our, our numbers is the cost benefit analysis. Okay, we got this group here. We got this big DTS that had these teams going here, and the, it costs many many thousands in air tickets. It, it, cost chunks of their lives, chunks of the staff's lives, and they, they go in their DTS teams here, here, and here. Okay, what was the impact of that? Hmm. And was, was the fruit worth the cost? And I think we need, to, we need to be very intentional about our short-term teams. I believe in short-term teams. I've, I've led them since the beginning of my time in, in YWAM, since 74. But um, we need to be very strategic about the short-term teams to make sure that their impact is worth the cost. Yes. So what and do you say? Another point is, is that in pioneering, your team is going to be small. Hmm. So that's why I say, don't let's, let's not just throw out everything that's small. YWAM in the early years was, was Lauren. And then uh, YOM doubled in staff when he married Darlene. So that was small. 
So I'm glad we didn't stop everything right then. Hmm. Yes. Do you think that we have um, we are struggling with yeah discernment at the at the root of things in a sense because oftentimes you hear oh God said you know and then you go with the religious and that's the easiest way to do and then everything else you know it's really hard to go up against something God said to somebody. Um, so have have we lost that inability to to discern God's voice in our teams and in our ministries, you think, or something that needs strengthening? Yeah, because as you say, people just uh, use it as an excuse. Well, God told me. It's like a few years ago, we had this rash of DTS students who were coming to our DTSs in Europe and saying, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't come to DTS to, to um, do work duties. God didn't tell me to do this work duty. I came to DTS and I'll do the worship and the intercession and I'll, I want the teaching, but God didn't tell me to do the work duty. Well, I had a school leader come to me and say, what do I tell these kids? <laughs> I said, you tell them that God spoke to us to have work duty in every single U of N school. And he knew we had work duties. So if, if he told you to come to this DTS, you do the, the work duty because of what he already said at, at the beginning. Actually, you should start that by saying, did God tell you to come here or not? And they always say, oh, yeah, God told me. I heard his voice. I said, well, DTS is part of, work duty is part of what happens in the DTS. And he told you, knowing that you would have to do work duty. So here's the broom. Thank you. Yeah. So we need to we need to not just back down when people say, "Well, God told me," and we need to learn how to respond like, "Well, then He'll tell me too." So I'm going to go pray and put this before before Him for three days, and I'll get back to you. There was one one more question. That was actually where I would have liked to start, but that's to do with the timing. Um, because as you said earlier, you know, pruning is brutal. Um, and it seems especially brutal at spring when everything is just buzzing and the, you, you see the signs of fruit and then you are to cut that off, you know. Um, and it seems, the word seems also quite brutal now with this whole global, you know, the pandemic and so on, oh, where, yeah. uh, where some people might feel they're being hit while they're already down. Um, so I don't know if you have any wisdom to us in taking this word also further um, in, in light of everything that is going on. Um, if you have any further wisdom in that. Yeah. Well, timing is very important because um, you, you plant, if you prune certain plants at the wrong time, you will stop all flowering, therefore all fruit. Like a classic mistake is to prune um, flowering bushes in the autumn, which is a time when you do prune certain things. But you should prune bushes that flower in the spring, like lilacs, forsythia, etc. You prune them just after flowering. And then you let them grow during the rest of the year. And then they will bear flowers and fruit after that. So the timing is going to be different according to each type of plant. And, and I think it would be perfectly valid for, for somebody, to, some group to pray and say, we don't feel the time of pruning is for now. We're open to this word, but we're, the Lord isn't saying that to us. We're going to get going in the ministry. He's, he's just opening the doors, and we're going to do that. Yeah. And we'll keep this word in, in mind, and maybe it's for later. I'm perfectly fine with that. What I, what I do fear a bit, as I told you, is just to rush to get back to normal and and to miss this opportunity to really see some changes in my life. Yeah. yeah. Our basis, friends, are not going to disciple the spheres. <clears throat> They're not doing it. Now, people from the bases are doing it, doing some great things. A base could be re 
imagined to influence the spheres, for example, around seminars. But our, our classic 12-week schools filling a base are not going to disciple the spheres. They're good at discipling individuals, and we need to keep that up. I'm not saying do away with those, those structures. I'm just saying if we want to get serious about the spheres as the gay lesbian people have, we need to change what we're doing. We need a new strategy, and for that, we need new structures. And the, the Norwegian guys are leading us out. Follow the Vikings. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tom. Really appreciate you taking this time to be with us. Um, thank you for yeah, wrestling with us and being willing to also do some more. But just in closing now, can we ask you to pray for you? We would really appreciate that. Um, also, as we dig into further process, both here and in our own acts, as well as in, uh, in our local areas. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for these testimonies of open doors, like in, in London and in, in Russia. And we trust you to open even more doors as people are faced with their need of you in this time, that they wouldn't just focus on their need of toilet paper, but they would focus on their need of you and use this as a spiritual wake-up call and send us into that breach, we pray, that's happening in every single nation on earth. And I pray for my friends here in, in this time, in this season, I pray for great wisdom and discernment we have not gone this way before none of us has been through anything like it our nations haven't even and it is a test for leadership as we're seeing in some leaders certain leaders are or some nations certain leaders are are showing how weak they are and how incompetent other leaders are showing their strength and their beautiful influence and we think of queen elizabeth's speech a few days ago and i pray for this kind of gracious strong loving wisdom for for each of our leaders in ywam help us to show show us what to prove mm. show, show us what sabbath should mean in our context in our community because it'll look different from community to, to community we're just trusting you to to take us by the hand and walk us through this time. Yes. Help us not to miss any opportunity in this crisis. <clears throat> and help us to use the pressure to turn ourselves to you, to walk even more closely with you. Yeah. And thank you for this privilege. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. Um, uh, Tom, especially for the time and the, and the love you are expressing through your wisdom and your words and your openness also to be interactive uh, with some of our questions.